Hello, everybody, and welcome to today's webinar, where we are very fortunate to have Dr. Thomas Lancaster here to speak on the subject of contract cheating in the context of COVID-19. My name is Rosalind, and I will be introducing Dr. Lancaster today, as well as providing you with a little information about Epigeum. And I will also be introducing my colleague, Laura Dent, our Director of Publishing and Learning Design, who will be giving you a brief overview of the work that we have undertaken in the area of academic integrity with Dr. Lancaster, amongst others. I will also be keeping an eye on any questions that come in over the next 45 minutes or so, so that we can address these at the end. Everybody on the call today is currently muted to help avoid any audio issues. However, you should each be able to see a control panel for the GoToWebinar software that we're using today, usually positioned at the top or on the right hand side of your screen. And this can be expanded or hidden by clicking on the button with a white arrow on an orange background. Within that control panel, you should see a questions drop down where you're able to type in any comments or questions you may have, which we will come to at the end. So to set the scene a little, I'd just like to begin by telling you a little more about Epigeum, which was originally founded as a spin-out company from Imperial College London and is now part of Oxford University Press. Over the past 15 years or so, we have established an international reputation as a provider of interactive online courseware for the higher education sector producing and hosting training courses that support the core activities of universities and colleges in four key areas, research, teaching and development, studying, and support and well-being. One of the things that sets us apart is the collaborative development model which we use to produce our online courses. This process allows us to draw on the expertise and experience of a team of advisors, authors, reviewers, and partner institutions, in order to develop a resource that is of the very highest quality. And actually, that is where Dr. Lancaster comes in, as he worked with us on the development of our interactive online academic integrity programme, which was published just last year. Now, I'm sure Dr. Lancaster needs no introduction as such, but suffice to say that he is one of the world's leading researchers into educational integrity, and particularly in the areas of contract cheating and plagiarism detection. His recent publications have focused on examining the supply and demand of contract cheating services, why students say they cheat, and how cheating differs across academic disciplines. As well as publishing and presenting widely on these themes, Dr. Lancaster is also a member of the QAA Academic Integrity Advisory Group and the organizing committee for the annual International Day of Action Against Contract Cheating. We were immensely lucky to have Dr. Lancaster bring his experience and insights to bear as an author on our academic integrity resource, and we're delighted that he's able to join us today. And so without further ado, I will now hand over to Dr. Lancaster to take us through five key ideas to consider in relation to contract cheating in the context of COVID-19. Well, thank you, Rosalind. And there we go, here's the, the screen option has arrived. So now you should all be able to see my screen. Thank you everyone for joining me today to talk about contract cheating and thank you to Epigeum for the invitation. We're in a sort of fast moving world at the moment with all the changes to education, to how we teach and how we support students in light of COVID-19. And I want to pick up really on five ideas for you to take away and think about in your own institution, in your own teaching. Uh, I've got a very great introduction, so I won't tell you much more about me. I work at Imperial College London. I teach computer science. I've had a variety of roles around the UK. But do feel free to tweet while this presentation is going on. I've put my handle, Dr. Lancaster, at Epigeum at the bottom, and also the hash contract cheating hashtag as well there. So feel free to connect with me. There's quite a lot of activity going on around that hashtag today already. I think it's handy just to start off by reminding us what contract cheating is. I don't think there is a single accepted 
formal definition of it, but at a very high level, dating back to the work I did with the late Robert Clark in 2006 uh, and onwards, then we're looking particularly at where a student gets a third party to do their work for them. Usually for the purposes of assessment, they don't acknowledge they've done this. Normally they pay somebody, but contract cheating can also just involve them asking a friend or family member to do the work on their behalf. And most importantly, this means a student is getting an unfair advantage over other students. And ultimately they can be getting an academic qualification that they don't deserve. Here's a very quick map of how the landscape, how the timeline has moved on from 2006 to today. We wrote that first paper back in 2006. It looked at data from a couple of years earlier than that. But of course, there were students using ghost writers before 2006. We can trace these back to at least the 1950s based on small ads in newspapers. So what has really changed in the period between 2006 and today is providers have decided this is the perfect way they can make money. They can easily connect with students over the internet or, or when COVID-19 isn't there face to face. Uh, uh, they can connect with people who can write assignments or create other types of non-written assignments very cheaply as so it's really been that perfect storm. On top of those changes, we're also seeing COVID-19. So for my institution, a very fast move of teaching and exams online. I'm sure you can think of something very similar in your own situation. And then 2020 and beyond, who knows what will happen over the next academic year? What situation will we be in? So that is my baseline for this presentation to pick up on five key ideas. And in each case, I'm gonna run through a few examples related to that idea and leave you with something to think about, which we can pick up as you prefer in the discussion and Q&A at the end of the presentation. So very importantly, in, in the UK, we will be having new students join us in September 2020. If you're in Australia, I think you have a slightly different timeline, but students are preparing to join courses even today. But we know in the run up to every academic year, contract cheating providers are trying to make connections with students before that academic year starts. And we see this in the kind of spam emails that are sent out. This is a completely unsolicited email, which I received in my um, email account there, very focused, offering me help with my computer science assignments and homeworks. Uh, you see a link there to a site registered incredibly recently, April 2020. The, from that site, you can find other contract cheating sites, one dating back to 2019, but essentially the same provider has multiple front ends to their business. These sites based in an IP address in Dallas, Texas. And if you were to look, you would see this kind of specialized services offered. Now, again, I know these are aimed at allegedly computer science students, although if you were to read through the services, you'll probably see they are, they're quite general. And in fact, down at the bottom, there are comments like MS Word only, no Excel work or quantitative work. And then you can upgrade to a higher price package and get Excel work. Now, if you were from computer science, you would know that basic work using Word and Excel is not going to be terribly advanced computer science work, which involves much more building computer systems rather than using computer packages. At which point you may also have noticed the word packages at the top of the screen straight from their website, the spelling of which would not particularly fill me with confidence to go ahead and order from that service. But sometimes students don't realize that. They look at that, they look at this careful pricing, and you'll probably see come some kind of structure there that's not obvious, but you can get work in 24 hours apparently, uh, and you can get no plagiarism. You get unlim unlimited revisions. How that works within 24 hours, who knows? But this is very typical of the type of services you see being promoted to students. 
We also see no end of services promoted through social media. I put a link to a recent paper I presented at um, the first Canadian symposium on academic integrity, also been published in that journal there. But specifically, services are, con are connecting with students, but they're also connecting with writers because they need that continual stream of people who are writing the work, generally very cheaply. They offer discounts there, and they use this to develop whole communities of people interested in contract cheating. The whole community approach can be very deceptive as well. So I mentioned as part of this idea that I'm thinking particularly about how services are connecting with students in the run up to the new academic year. And these are the kind of things that are happening. This is an article that was published in quite a few newspapers last year about SA Mill firms pretending to be young women, generally trying to connect with male students as, as friends, but without letting on that they are there from SA Mill, they just look like they might be another new student joining the same course this student is on. And particularly for international students, but I think this year with COVID-19 and people studying remotely in many situations, it will be the same with home students. There are lots of new student Facebook groups and WhatsApp groups being formed where people can make friends, form connections, probably work out what groups they want to work in. Uh, in other years, they would work out who they want to live with uh, and generally discuss the course, set their fears to one side. But what happens when these services get inside these groups pretending to be a fellow student? They wait, they talk to our new students who are going to join us and then when it turns out a student is on the course they're struggling they're finding the going difficult they don't know how to approach an assignment they send a very soft sell out saying well uh, I was struggling too but I, I found this firm or my friends who helped me with the work always using that very persuasive gentle language at least to start with and they start marketing contract cheating offers to students so what do we need to do in light of this? I think we need to make sure that students have access to university endorsed groups, whether they choose to use them or not. But we also monitor quite carefully who is in those groups. But we need to think about our pre-induction type activities as well. And a sort of question for you to think about in your own situation, how do we avoid students using these services, particularly if they're based remotely as a result of COVID-19? I said services and marketing to our students haven't even arrived yet. Of course, they are also marketing to our current students as well. I'm sure many of you will have seen examples of this, but they're marketing very specifically based on COVID-19. Here's an example of the contents of an email. It was sent to me by another academic saying essentially, the COVID-19 outbreak has, has raised a ruckus out there, hasn't it? But I so said, we can still help you. We will give you 15% off. These discount offers are very common. And down at the bottom, things like we are still 24 seven online support despite COVID scare. So firms are looking at COVID-19 as an opportunity to market even more strongly than they would have done beforehand as well. That's not just the case in unsolicited emails. That's also the case with, with tweets and other adverts. There's another one, uh, the kind of selling point perhaps would work for me, the very cheapest essay you can get. Uh, who knows if quality and price are interlinked there. But another discount offer to go with that, but very importantly, we are caring for you. you um, you're not going to catch corona because you're going to stay at home and we're going to do your work. Does that not sound so nice and caring? Uh, many of the services have now got dedicated web pages on their sites. Here is a much bigger discount offer. Don't let coronavirus affect your grades. In this case, they are offering 50% off there. Uh, but apart from that very similar type of marketing, but quite strong marketing from the point of view of the firm, they want to get the student's email address or their Facebook account access, because once they have that, they can keep marketing to the same student again and again and again, hoping that that student will become dependent on contract cheating. 
and just like legitimate websites, so many of the services now have one of these bars at the top of the site saying, we are still working normally, you can WhatsApp us, uh, we're taking precautions, we're protecting our staff, there'll be no interruptions to our service. In the first case, our team and academics are working safely. Take that word academics with a pinch of salt, incidentally, because chances are that they, they won't be academics in the maybe the sense that you or I would think of academics writing these assignments for students. Students do request work themselves as well. This is the type of tweet you may see on Twitter. Another quite recent one, quite um, topical. Write my essay about COVID-19, I'll pay. And very quickly, this student got 26 replies, a lot more than I can show on here. There's probably more today for us to go back and look at this one, but you can find many similar examples there. Terms like diligent writer, A plus academic solutions. So these services are still ready and waiting to react very quickly to any requests that students make there. Often they will react to requests a student doesn't make. So even if a student had a frustration post on Twitter saying, oh, I'm finding this assignment really difficult, I'm fed up with this homework, whatever it might be, they will get a visible request sent back and they'll get private requests sent to their direct messages as well. Students also help one another, using that word help as in doing their assignment for them. Uh, we did some work in Southeast Europe. We interviewed students, held focus groups, going back in uh, a couple of years ago, published last year as a journal paper. And one of the key findings that we had from that research was that students were doing the work for other students. A term a student said to us is that in any class, you could find one of the students who they can call upon, who will be the go-to person who is happy to earn a bit of extra money doing work for their peers. I think that happens in the UK as well, perhaps not quite to the same extent, but all our students know there is a go-to person they can use. So in light of our COVID-19 uh, marketing, how can we look at this as providing a bit more of an opportunity for us and discouraging students from taking advantage of these services? A word I've mentioned already have been words like caring, but a very specific word is the word of support. And I'd like you now to think about the support network available for students in light of COVID-19. We know already there is a support network produced by the contract cheating industry. This is a physical flyer which was on many lampposts around Birmingham. I've seen very similar ones around London. They happen around many universities. But that prominent word at the top of the page is support. And of course, these services don't want to position themselves as cheating. They want to position themselves as helping. It sounds much better when it's talked about that way. We've moved a lot of our assessments to online exams, many cases open book exams, perhaps due to the necessity of the recent situation. But there are sites out there that are ready and waiting to provide exam answers to students. There's one which we'd call perhaps a file sharing or note sharing site at the left of your screen. Uh, they will not call themselves a contract cheating site, but essentially you send us our question, one of the experts will get you an answer back in 30 minutes. That's perfectly fine to do with an exam situation, particularly if there's no sort of monitoring going on. And uh, there has been a whole host of discussions about this particular site, Chegg on Twitter, where we know students have been using this site during their online exams uh, and providing the answers, but what students did not know is that if we put a request in to check an official university request, they have information on their site where they will release details of which students were using their service. So essentially students are up in arms because they are saying, um, we, we paid to get these answers and um, you're exposing us. Um, ethical or not, uh, you make your own judgment there. Of course, many uh, academics have no idea this is happening, and this is not the only site of this type. Uh, likewise, students are making requests. I've done a lot of work in the past using a site called Freelancer. Uh, one example there for a computer science assignment, somebody saying, can you essentially be online to answer my exam for me? 
and at the time I grabbed this, there were eight offers, I'm sure there were many more, relatively cheaply, depending how much you think £29 is worth to get your exam solved for you. I mentioned our work in Southeast Europe, one of the other main findings from that study was that hidden earpieces to take physical exams were really common. They were advertised on notice boards, nobody gave them a, a second thought, but people could buy these very miniature earpieces, or they could hire them, but they could also hire somebody outside the exam room to um, whisper, that was the term the students used, answers to them. Now, these happen in the UK as well. If you were to look on some of the main online marketplaces, you will find these available for sale. But with remote exams, we don't even need um, the earpieces to be there if we don't have the right infrastructure set up to make sure the exams are secure. Our contract treatment services are also trying to position themselves using many marketing techniques as legitimate. Here are two books available on the world's biggest bookstore. There are, there are many more, but you'll notice the, the firm name at the bottom there, SA Shark, which is a contract cheating service, positioning themselves as being legitimate by releasing books for students to tell them how to write better essays. And decent number of ratings there, decent star ratings for the books as well. Now, of course, you, you have to believe that as soon as the students get hold of these books, they also know there is a service available that if they don't want to write the essay themselves, they can go straight to. So we also need to be thinking about what support materials we're providing to students so they get the correct ones as opposed to ones the essay industry would like them to have. So overarching question in relating to idea number three is, what is our support network for students? How can we make sure that it's correct? And I think most importantly, how can we make sure that students use this and don't just ignore it? Now we come on with idea number four to the consequences. What happens if we don't act upon contract cheating, especially in light of COVID-19? Uh, I want to draw your attention to a recent paper by Zenith Khan and, and colleagues. They've thought particularly about contract cheating being a social issue. So quite often we only think that contract cheating, yes, it hurts the individual student because they don't learn, but it does hurt people around them as well. And I'm not going to read out all the examples here, but if a student cheats once, then they miss out on learning. They may find themselves dependent on using external services in the future. But there is a wider effect on the community. We're getting graduates who are not ready to do the jobs that uh, we're hoping to, we're hoping they go into. That also has a reputational effect on the university sector as a whole, if we don't address contract cheating. But I think many of these issues are even more pronounced now in light of COVID-19. And there are a lot of quite challenging ethical questions, and I mean, these are always worth discussing, discussing with students as well. Here's an example of something that was on an online forum. There, a student said, essentially, they have paid for a dissertation, but the service now has disappeared. Their website has disappeared. They're not going to be able to complete their work on time because they're not going to get it. Now, of course, you may be completely unsympathetic about that situation, but Presumably, this is some kind of scam at the, the back end of all of this. I mentioned at the very start about sites being set up uh, very recently. Many of these sites don't exist for very long at all. They exist long enough for a student to buy from them, for them to get a few orders, collect some money, and then they disappear. And there's very little comeback. But what would you do in your university if this kind of situation had happened? Would you be sympathetic because the student owned up? Because we do need to get that trust from students when that happens. And a very similar kind of situation is extortion or blackmail. Once a student has handed in work, they're at the mercy of the firms and the writers who provided this work for them. This this is an example of part of a very long process that a student who, ha who was being blackmailed sent to me. Um, this is a fake letter. The Department of Education does not send out letters like this, but essentially the firm sent this to the student, 
saying uh, we've been told by the Department of Education we have to send details of all our customers to them, but if you send us a bit more money, we will miss your name off that list. Uh, and to me, it was very obviously fake. There are many giveaways in the, the longer letter, but to the student, it wasn't. What happens if a student is in this situation? How can we support them within our institution? Of course, they have done something wrong. They shouldn't be in the situation, but they are where they are. And we want them to know there is a support network there for them. Uh, many students don't believe there is a risk of, of blackmail, incidentally. This is a very recent paper by John York and Leslie Savick and colleagues looking, asking students about contract cheating and blackmail. 90% of students were completely unaware this was even an option for them. And some of them were willing to take the risk. Here is a reason one of the students gave, which I think is um, very illustrative. They said the, the cost of, of taking the risk and cheating is 150 Australian dollars um, if I don't get caught. Um, if I don't take that and fail, it will cost me $1,500 to repeat the unit. So, so your risk reward ratio is very much on the side of the firms in situations like this. So students will be tempted. In fact, I could say probably in the UK situation, if you have to repeat a year, it will cost you a lot more than that by the time you consider your tuition fees, but also your cost of living and everything that goes alongside that, as well as the fact that you're, um, you're losing a year of working professionally as well. So what's our support network that means that students possibly can repeat rather than being drawn towards these services? And how do we ensure that our students are not going to be, uh, not going to end up being taken advantage of by the contract cheating industry in light of COVID-19? Uh, I just want to finish by looking, I think, possibly the most powerful idea in all of this about action we can take. This has worked very well in many universities around the world, but it's developing our students as our partners in academic integrity and our advocates. And I can tell you that uh, unfortunately, a lot of what we do is geared towards a small number of students, but generally there are uh, the vast majority of students don't want to cheat. Uh, some of them are not too concerned what other students do, but there are enough of them who are very concerned if other students are cheating and getting away with it because they feel it devalues their own qualification. There, there is very much an a global question here is, do our students understand what academic integrity is? Now, like whenever we present and talk about ethics, which I think we do in many courses, some of these concepts can be quite hard to define. And students may have an overall idea. Often they say something like, what is academic integrity? It means don't cheat. But there's a lot of subtleties beyond that that we need to think about. Something that's become clear in much of my research is that Quite often, we don't ever sit down anywhere and teach students how to write, how to reference, and why we think these skills are so important. There's often this idea that, uh, oh, someone else on the course m must be teaching it, but often it's missed out completely, or it's just not reinforced. So students think, okay, it was important in this module, but this particular lecturer hasn't mentioned it, they don't care about it, we don't need to worry about it. So we need to be continuing to have those conversations with students and also helping them to understand why doing their own work will be of benefit to them in the future. We are seeing students speaking out. Um, here's another example from Zenith and College's paper. This is a firm contacting a student through Messenger, trying to get them to give contact details of fellow students. Often the firms do this. They say, oh, you tell us the names of your friends. If they order, we'll give you a discount on your next order. So it's this um, essentially going for this kind of viral marketing effect here. But the student here spoke out against this and said, contract cheating is ethically wrong. It goes against academic integrity. I'm not willing to do this, which is a kind of activity we should be rewarding and encouraging for many more of our students, not just to ignore it, but to actively speak out against it.
Uh, we've had some very successful physical events over the past few years, including the International Day of Action Against Contract Cheating that takes place in October every year. This is an example from Dury, the American College of Greece, about all the activities they had surrounding that day. Uh, things like, in the background, a fingerprint of uniqueness, stickers available, lots of posters about work the students have done. But can we recognize and reward academic integrity? Some universities have started to have award ceremonies where there can be an academic integrity award given to either staff or students. But what can we do to make this be seen as important and bring our students into this? Here's another example. This has been really popular in many institutions, this format of a graffiti wall. This one for a Marjan College in Oman, where people write down their statements about why they don't believe in contract cheating. Now, we're still in early days about planning our next event for October, but there's nothing to stop universities having their own local events, courses having their own events. But if we are teaching online in a COVID-19 world, how can we make these kind of events work best for students? Can we bring students in as our partners when we're trying to organize these events as well? Because we don't want it to just seem as if something we're pushing and nobody else cares about it. We wanted to, to see man, we want that community feel to it. So something for you to think about, um, what are these events? Of course, we do have to teach students about academic writing, referencing, all the related skills, but alongside that, how can we promote this wider ethical view? How can we demonstrate this in our own activities? So at this point, I'm almost ready to pass back over to Epigeum to talk a bit more about the Academic Integrity Program. As I mentioned, I was one of the authors for that program, along with many colleagues, bringing in many skills and experience from around the sector, but I do want you to consider these ideas as well about how do we help students, particularly vulnerable, in light of a contract cheating industry that is already adapted to COVID-19. I think they adapted much quicker to changing their marketing than we did to changing our teaching and learning. How can we make our online learning work for students so students benefit and make our online assessment robust? What do we do in terms of support, both to ensure that students don't end up turning to the contract cheating industry in the first place, but also to ensure that uh, if they do become ensnared, uh, they are at risk of being extorted, that we have processes in place to help them and to help them get back on track there. And can we have nuanced conversations? Because this isn't just um, a black and white issue, there are shades of grey about academic integrity and what's acceptable in different situations. So thank you so much for your attention today. I hope this has been useful and you've got some take home ideas. I put my contact details on this slide as well, slide as well, the slides will be available afterwards. Do just tweet me at, at Dr Lancaster and um, I will take questions in a few minutes. Thank you. Thank you so much um, for such a thought provoking analysis of this current climate. And I'm sure that it's raised a lot of questions and ideas. So do please keep um, entering those into the question box and we'll turn to those very shortly. Um, before we do, though, our Director of Publishing and Learning Design, Laura Dent, will take just a couple of moments to provide you with some information about our online academic integrity programme, which was developed over a two year period in collaboration with a number of international higher education institutions and under the guidance of lead advisor, Professor Tracy Bretag, um, with the expert input of a team of reviewers and authors, including, of course, Dr. Lancaster. So over to you, Laura. Thanks, Rosalind. Um, so, yeah, when we were developing um, the Academic Integrity Programme, we really wanted to support institutions and, and almost help them rethink the way they could approach the theme of academic integrity through um, an online training programme. So we worked with um, Professor Tracy Bretag on, on really the vision for the programme. So drawing on Tracy's own research into the efficacy of holistic preventative training 
um, when tackling uh, some of these issues. And then we were obviously thrilled uh, when Thomas joined uh, the collaboration as an author for some of the modules. Um, and we worked with um, a wide range of, of institutions really to, to draw on their experiences and, and challenges um, working with students and staff in this area. We wanted the coverage to really move beyond that of a typical anti-plagiarism course. And so on the next screen, um, I think you can uh, see an overview of um, some of the approaches that we took. So the, the programme is um, actually made up of staff and student strands. So the staff uh, modules look at uh, look at academic integrity and, and how it's relevant to differing roles and what uh, roles uh, and parts staff can play in uh, ensuring integrity across the institution. Also looks at practical ideas for promoting academic integrity, uh, how they can recognise and respond to breaches, and it also gives a lot of guidance on assessment uh, design, uh, and that covers group work as well. So the last two modules really focus on that um, assessment design approach. On the student side, um, we have modules that really look at the, the key principles and behaviours um, for academic integrity. Um, and I think um, you can sort of see indicated on the slide that one of the things we really wanted to do was instill positive values, skills and behaviours in the course coverage. So for students we look at um, how they can incorporate those best practices and behaviours in the work, uh, be that through uh, you know how they cope with pressures, uh, how they prioritise and then in more complex scenarios uh, such as larger pieces of work um, and uh, really reflecting on their own academic integrity journey, I guess, over, over their university experience. So one of the ways we do this is through real life applications. Um, we use a lot of, of different approaches. Uh, we've got video interviews in there with students and staff. Uh, we've got some really good animations actually, which just bring some of the concepts to life. And we have, uh, realistic scenarios and, and polls throughout all the modules. So we look at examples of best practice and, and kind of model model that behaviour, but we also take time to explore the potential pitfalls. So when we're looking at uh, issues of contract cheating, for example, which we explore from the staff perspective and the student perspective, um, in the student side, we really challenge, for example, the, the idea that perhaps lots of people are, are using contract cheating sites and that it's relatively normal to use a, a contract cheating service. Um, so we look at views of other students, um, so peers um, who, who kind of advocate almost for that academic integrity message. And we look at things like um, employer reactions or the idea of the degree being devalued. So I think um, that's one of the ways we really look into some of the, the nuances of academic integrity and, and the behaviours um, around that. Um, hopefully that gives you a bit of an overview of the approach that we've taken. Um, we do uh, try and facilitate a, a blended approach, so as well as the online learning modules, uh, that we offer. We also offer a series of instructor manuals for the staff and the student strands to give additional videos and additional workshop activities so that you can go and uh, explore those issues and, and scenarios further in, in workshops or discussion forums. Over to you, Rosmond. Thank you. So that's just an overview of the modules that I, I spoke through earlier. Perfect. Thank you very much, Laura, for that um, explanation. And we would love to share 
more information about the programme with all of you who've joined us for the webinar today and provide you with trial access to any and all of these modules, um, as well as some details about the subscription options that are available for your institution. So if that would be of interest, please either drop us an email, epigeum at oup.com, or visit our website, where as well as requesting a free trial, you can also watch a short video introduction to the programme and download a flyer to share with your colleagues. And that is also provided as a handout um, from today's session. You can also follow our work in this area on our LinkedIn and Twitter channels. Just search for Epigeum.